Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the seventh week in the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. We continue this week with Dr. Nancy Chen. And before I introduce Nancy, I'll make a few announcements. First, if you're participating via Zoom, you should see a Q&A tab on either the top or the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you click on that tab, you'll see that you can ask questions, you can, you can type any questions that you have, as well as see and upvote other people's questions. And at the end of the talk, we'll go through those questions, starting with the ones with the most votes. Um, but if you have a clarifying question that you feel like needs to be addressed during the talk in order for you to understand something, you can type clarification in capital letters at the start of your question, and Nancy has said she'll do her best to answer those clarification questions in real time. Second, recordings of all the talks are available on YouTube shortly after they conclude, so if you need to leave early or know others who can't attend live, this talk will be available for viewing and reviewing after it's complete. Third, you may have seen this on Twitter already, but we have a scheduling change for next week. Next week, we're going to be hearing from uh, Janet Mann, and then uh, that's next week on June 30th, and then we'll hear from Ben Danzer on July 14th. So the two of them are just switching slots. And finally, thanks to everyone who submitted nominees for the fall. We got a really strong response, uh, such that we have many more nominees than we have weeks. So thank you very much for making our job uh, challenging. And now I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nancy Chen, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Rochester. Nancy received her bachelor's degree from Harvard before uh, getting her PhD at Cornell, where she worked with Andy Clark and John Fitzpatrick. She spent a year as a postdoc at Cornell before accepting an MSF uh, Biological Collections postdoctoral fellowship and working at UC Davis. Then in 2018, she became an assistant professor at the University of Rochester, where her lab combines genomics and uh, extensive pedigree data with long term demographics within long term demographic studies to answer questions in evolutionary biology and conservation genomics. And the pedigree in the uh, scrub jay population that we'll hear about today allows Nancy and her lab to perform truly unparalleled analyses of short term evolutionary dynamics. And I saw Nancy give a talk at Duke last year, and so I knew that she would be perfect for this series for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is obvious, which is that her work leverages the power of this, this long-term data. Um, but second, she brings a population genetics approach that's relatively uncommon in the long-term EEV field. And she's able to present her really groundbreaking work in a way that is simultaneously exciting to folks with pop gen experience and expertise and is also perfectly approachable to those like me that lack that expertise and sometimes find population genetics to be a bit intimidating. So I'm really excited to see this talk. And uh, with that, I'm glad to turn things over to Nancy. Okay, thank you so much, Matthew, for organizing this uh, seminar series and for giving me an opportunity to present. Um, I will try to live up to all the nice things you just said. <laughs> Um, so, as Matthew mentioned, uh, the work in my lab is primarily focused on understanding how short-term um, evolution works in natural populations. Um, and one of the best opportunities for doing so is using these kind of unique long-term demographic studies. So by now we have a lot of really beautiful examples of rapid phenotypic evolution in nature. So textbook examples include the rapid evolution of melanism and peppered moths as a kind of consequence of industrialism in the UK. Also the evolution of beak size and shape in Darwin's finches. Um, we are getting more and more uh, examples of rapid phenotypic evolution caused by anthropogenic measures as well. So, so for, exam for example, hunting has caused kind of evolution of decreased body weight and horn length in sheep. Um, so in some of these cases, we do, in fact, so the peppered moths and Darwin's finches, we have some idea of the genes underlying this rapid phenotypic change. But for the most part, we still lack a kind of deep understanding of how short-term evolutionary change occurs at the level of the genome, at the genomic level. And understanding this is really important and relevant these days because of kind of the importance of understanding rapid evolution for many different contexts, including understanding how populations respond to climate change, 
or um, the evolution of pesticide or antibiotic existence or resistance, sorry. Um, and also just understanding how populations can or cannot respond to anthropogenic change. So why is it so important to understand kind of evolution at the level of the genome? I'd like to remind you all that the most basic definition of evolution is in fact the change in allele frequencies over time. So in a population, we typically have a sample of individuals and uh, there are a number of different processes that may change the uh, frequency of different alleles in the population over time. Um, these include mutation, mutation will generate new, variation, uh, gene flow in and out of the population can increase or decrease levels of genetic variation. Genetic drift, drift typically acts to remove genetic variation in a population over time and selection again can either increase or decrease levels of genetic variation. And so understanding the evolutionary processes that um, govern allele frequency change has been the central focus of the field of population genetics and understanding, and typically in population genetics, what we do is we go out to a population of interest um, and we sample a population and um, look at patterns of genetic variation in order to make inferences about these evolutionary processes. So here I'm just kind of showing you a cartoon example of a single population with uh, individuals and the different colors of the individuals indicate their different genotypes. If we're lucky, we may have multiple uh, temporal samples from the same population, which gives us a little bit more power to measure changes in allele frequency. But again, we're relying on kind of a huge body of work um, that is uh, focused on using patterns of genetic variation in order to make inferences about the relative importance of like drift, gene flow, selection, um, mutation, et cetera. But one thing to keep in mind is that in natural populations, what is really happening is that different individuals um, survive and reproduce and move around the landscape. And it's these individual level processes um, that are changing the allele frequencies over time. And all of these processes are essentially encapsulated in what's called the population pedigree. Um, so the population pedigree is the set of relationships among all individuals in the population over time. And what this pedigree does is that it allows us to directly observe the evolutionary processes that change allele frequencies. And this is because um, using the pedigree, we can actually estimate um, different genetic contributions of different individuals over time. And it's this variation in individual genetic contributions that actually causes the allele frequency change that we see. Um, and this framework, uh, is also really useful in thinking about how kind of individual fitness may then kind of may then impact allele frequency change in a population. So this seems uh, having information of the population pedigree is nice and wonderful, but like, is this even possible? So luckily for us, there are several long-term demographic studies um, in existence. You've heard about a lot of work from other studies. And many of these studies have actually nearly complete population pedigrees. And so they give us a really nice opportunity to look, use these populations in order to elucidate how um, allele frequencies have been changing over time. So the system that um, my lab primarily works on is the Floor Describe J, Athelic and Lacour Lessons. This beautiful blue bird here is a cooperative breeder. Many of you may know about this bird um, from animal behavior. So offspring of, um, of this species delay dispersal and stay around to help their parents raise future offspring. Um, they're related to this really unique fire maintained scrub habitat in Florida and they are federally threatened. They are, there are a few aspects of its biology that make this species um, particularly amenable to long-term studies. So they're non-migratory and they're highly territorial and philopatric, making it possible to follow individuals throughout their lifespans. 
Also, they're socially and mostly genetically monogamous. There is a very, very low rate of extra pair paternity in the species, but for the most part, we can reconstruct accurate pedigrees from field observations alone. Um, they are also very curious birds and very easy to work with because they're addicted to peanuts. Um, although I should say that we minimize our contact with this population and uh, do not routinely feed the birds peanuts, especially not from our mouths. Um, so these jays, as I mentioned before, are restricted to this uh, dry xeric scrub habitat that's very closely linked to the natural fire cycle. Um, this kind of complicates conservation efforts because not only do you need to set aside and uh, scrub habitat, you also may need to make sure it's regularly burned. Um, because of you know, human development, the Florida scrub jays have drastically declined in range and numbers. So in the middle, I'm showing you the historical range of the jays in gray and the current range in green. Um, and on the right, you can see that the number of jays have declined by more than 97% in the past century. Um, so a lot of the work we do has conservation implications, although I won't be talking about that now. Um, it is worth mentioning one caveat um, of our work, which is that it's a lot easier to have a population pedigree and completely monitor your population when your population is small. Um, and so that's one thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about the generality of um, and kind of the interpretation of our results. So there's been one long-term demographic study at Archibald Biological Station. This population of birds has been individually banded and carefully monitored since 1969. There's an extensive amount of field work that goes into the study. So the entire population is censused every month, providing accurate information on individual lifespans for all the individuals in our population over time. Um, every nest of every um, family group is found and carefully monitored so we know how many eggs are laid, we know how many of those eggs hatched, and we know the fate of the, hatch the nestlings. Um, what's really important for my work is that um, my collaborators started taking blood samples from every nestling born in our population and every new immigrant appearing in our population starting in 1999. We have a few spotty um, samples from earlier years, but the really comprehensive blood sampling started in 1999. And so this means we have this kind of huge archive of DNA samples for um, everyone in our population going back for decades. Um, we also collect a suite of ecological data. So all the territories are mapped every year. Um, habitat quality is measured. We have information on weather, so temperature, rainfall, et cetera, and fire history and also food abundance over time. And so the study uh, over the past 50 years has accumulated um, a ton of information. And as a result, we can construct this really extensive pedigree. So we have this like 14 generation now pedigree that contains over 10,000 individuals. And so this extent of pedigree information um, is critical in our understanding of how kind of individual fitness varies over time and um, how that affects allele frequency change. Um, and finally, we also have fairly comprehensive genotyping um, of our population over time. So we developed a custom Illumina isolic bee chip for, to genotype around 4,000 birds at around 15,000 SNPs across the genome. Um, this graph on the bottom here, I'm showing you the total number of birds in our population over time in gray, and the number who are genotyped in blue. And as you can see, we've nearly um, genotyped every single individual in our population for the past decade plus. And so using the system, what I'm going to do now is tell you um, what we've learned about kind of how much variation there is in individual fitness, um, how we can use that information to learn about allele frequency change and the different evolutionary processes that are um, occurring in our population. 
and we'll mostly be focusing on kind of how important is drift, gene flow, and selection. So first, from the demographic data, uh, we found that there's really high variance in lifetime reproductive success in our population. Here, I'm defining lifetime reproductive success as the um, total number of nestlings produced over an individual's lifetime. Um, I'm showing you data for about 900 individuals who survived to breed um, and have also died by now, completed their lifetimes. As you can see, many, most individuals actually don't leave any offspring in the population, but we have some individuals who produce as many as 42 individuals during their lifetime. Um, scrub jays can live up to 15 years, but average lifespan is maybe about four to five years. Using the population pedigree, we can go beyond this like single, like commonly used single generation proxy for fitness and actually look at all of the, um, offspring that are descended from a particular individual. So to illustrate this, here is one male who showed up in our population in 1992. He had four kids. Um, none of his offspring survived to reproduce. So this is the pedigree of all of his descendants in our population over time. And we can contrast this with another male who showed up in our population the same year and had a much um, higher fitness. So he had 41 offspring and many of his offspring and grand offspring survived to reproduce. And so this is um, the pedigree of all of his descendants in our population up until um, 2013. So we can quantify this um, by using genealogical contributions over time. What I mean by genealogical contribution here is the proportion of the birth cohort in our population um, who is descended from our focal individual. So is genealogically related to that individual. Um, so for our first male, he had two offspring in 1994 and two offspring in 1996 and um, no descendants after that. And so his genealogical offspring or genealogical contribution to our population over time is essentially zero. You can contrast this with this other male um, who has a high, um, very high genealogical contribution to our population over time. In fact, it's a little remarkable that 25% of the birth cohort in our population in 2013 is descended from this one individual. Um, and one thing that uh, is useful to note is that the long-term, or so uh, one thing that's important to remember is that there's a difference between genealogical contributions um, and genetic contributions for a particular individual. So um, not all genealogical descendants actually inherit genetic material from a given ancestor. So in this kind of dummy cartoon pedigree, if we're looking at um, the contribution of the female highlighted in green, all of the individuals here um, that are empty are genealogical descendants of this particular individual, um, but due to the vagaries and randomness and Mendelian transmission, um, by chance there will be some of her descendants who actually do not inherit any mater genetic material from her. Um, and so this is because uh, if you remember, you inherit half your genome from your dad and half your genome from your mom. Um, and what segments of the genome are actually inherited is completely random and dependent on uh, recombination. So we can use our pedigree to estimate not only genealogical contributions, but the expected genetic contributions of a particular individual over time. And so the contrast here is that genealogical contributions are just looking at the proportion of the birth cohort um, who are uh, related to a particular individual and the genetic contributions we're tracking um, on average, how many of the alleles present in the birth cohort are inherited identical by descent from our focal individual. And so what I'm gonna do now is overlay the expected genetic contributions for these two individuals on these graphs in black. Um, and as you can see, the genealogical contribution of a particular individual is substantially higher than their expected genetic contribution, um, which is what we would expect given what we know about how inheritance works. 
we can take this a step further and kind of try to understand how kind of males and females might contribute to the population differently. Um, and I'll illustrate this using this one particular pair of individuals. Um, so these, this pair uh, um, did not mate with anyone else. So here is the pedigree of all of their descendants in our population over time. Um, they have a relatively high genealogical contribution to our population over time, here shown in blue, and um, they are gonna share the same kind of expected genetic contribution for a random, any given random autosomal locus in our population. Um, but if we think about the sex chromosomes, the picture is gonna be slightly different. So sex chromosomes have different transmission roles in um, birds. Um, females are the heterogametic sex. So females have ZW sex chromosomes and males have ZZ chromosomes. Um, females transmit their Z chromosome to their sons and their W chromosome to their daughters, whereas males transmit, transmit one copy of their Z chromosome um, to all of their offspring. And so because of these different kind of transmission roles, you might, uh, the genetic, expected genetic contributions of males and females on the Z chromosome are gonna be different, right? Because the male is transmitting a copy of Z to all of his offspring, whereas the female is only transmitting a copy of her Z to her daughters. And indeed, if we look at the expected genetic contribution of um, the male in this pair uh, shown in purple and the female shown in green, you can see that the male has a much higher expected genetic contribution over time. So if we randomly sample um, for a given Z-linked locus, if we randomly sample an allele in our birth cohort in 2013, um, it is much more likely uh, to be inherited from the male than the female. Um, we can also look at expected genetic contributions instead of particular individuals of looking at groups of individuals. Um, in our population, we're very interested in understanding the impact of gene flow. So from some previous work, we know that there's a relatively high level of immigration into our population. Um, it is decreasing over time. Um, and we have shown that um, this kind of decreased immigration in the population over time is responsible for increasing levels of inbreeding and decreased juvenile fitness in our population. So we wanted to know if we could actually quantify how much um, these incoming immigrants are actually contributing to levels of genetic variation in the population. And so here I'm showing you the uh, expected genetic contribution of incoming immigrants in our population starting in 1990. So here we're assuming that everyone in our population in 1990 is a resident. Any um, incoming bird uh, will be coded an immigrant. Um, the black line shows the cumulative contribution of all of these incoming immigrants. Um, and the colored stacked lines show um, the kind of added contribution of each in cohort of immigrants. So as you can see by 2013, about 75% um, of neutral genetic variation in our population is, has been brought in via immigration. Um, we fit a model and we predict that it will take on average about 32 years of, for 95% of neutral alleles to be um, completely replaced by immigration. So it's uh, clear that you know, gene flow is playing a huge role in kind of contributing to levels of genetic variation in our population over time. And this is consistent with earlier studies. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time talking about uh, expected genetic contributions of individuals and um, groups of individuals. Uh, we can also kind of fine tune this contribution of immigrants, of expected genetic contributions of immigrants into contributions from males versus females. Um, this is like part of some ongoing work trying to understand the impact of sex bias demography on short term evolutionary processes. So in our population, we have strongly female biased uh, dispersals. Most of the incoming immigrants in our population are females. 
And so if you look at the expected contributions of males in purple and females in green, you can see that um, there's a higher contribution from female immigrants for a given autosomal locus. But every incoming male brings in two copies of the Z and incoming females only bring in one copy of the Z. So we actually see the opposite pattern for Z-linked markers where um, the expected genetic contribution of male immigrants is actually higher than the expected genetic contribution of female immigrants. Um, I'd like to remind you all that um, it's this variation in individual genetic contributions that we've um, just spent a lot of time quantifying. It's this variation in genetic contributions over time that actually underlies allele frequency change in our population. And in fact, we can use these expected individual genetic contributions to actually try to predict how much allele frequency change we would have. Um, so here, the predicted allele frequency in our population at a given year is going to be a function of the expected individual genetic contributions um, for the founders in our population. So essentially individuals who have no known parents um, and the allele frequencies of these um, individuals. So in other words, we can use, for example, if we start our analyses in 1990, um, we can use the genotypes of the individuals present in our population in 1990 um, and estimate their genetic contributions in order to pre predict what the allele frequency should be in our population in say 2013. So using this approach, um, we predicted how much allele frequency change we should see in our population um, between 1999 and 2013 uh, for all of the SNPs across our genome. So here I'm showing you the actual observed allele frequency change on the x-axis and the predicted allele frequency change on the y-axis. You can see that um, we actually do a fairly good job um, trying to predict how much allele frequency change we should see from using the pedigree information alone. We were also interested in trying to understand if we can um, figure out what are the different evolutionary processes that are governing specific SNP trajectories in our population. Um, here I'm showing you the SNP trajectories of our you know, 15,000 SNPs in the population over time. Uh, we do in fact see a number of SNPs, so about 120 or so SNPs change in frequency by more than 0.15 over this relatively short time period. Um, and we wanted to understand what is driving these allele frequency changes. Is it all selection or are there other forces at play? So for some SNPs, we actually observe really large allele frequency shifts. So here's one particular SNP that has changed in frequency by more than 0.25 in this kind of short 15 year span. Um, and to try to model what is um, our neutral expectation for allele frequency change in our population over time, we use this method called gene dropping. So gene dropping is a simulation procedure where you take your population pedigree um, and you use the observed genotypes uh, for all founder, all founder individuals. So in this case, we use the genotypes of all individuals in our population starting in 1990, as well as the genotypes of any incoming immigrants, right? Because we don't know who the parents are for our immigrants. So using these um, founder genotypes, uh, we then simulate Mendelian transmission of alleles down the pedigree and repeat this process um, about a million times in order to obtain distributions of allele frequencies that we would expect under um, drift in the population. So this approach is uh, the most appropriate neutral model um, for if you have the ability um, to obtain population uh, pedigree information. So this kind of really takes care of any um, assumptions that you might break from a typical Wright Fisher model. So overlapping generations, highly related individuals, um, variance in population size over time, et cetera. So using uh, this gene dropping approach, we can kind of generate kind of our expected allele frequency distributions in the population over time. So here, this is our like one SNP that has changed in frequency over time. The observed allele frequency trajectory is shown in blue. 
Now I'm going to add the expected allele frequency trajectory shown in black with our confidence intervals in gray. You can see that our gene dropping simulations actually like quite well track the large increase in allele frequency over time. And we can go back um, and look at the allele frequencies of our incoming immigrants. And we can see that actually for this particular SNP, the allele frequency um, in incoming immigrants increased from about 0.51 in 1999 to 0.5, 0.71 in 2013. And in fact, it's, um, gene flow that is driving this really large allele frequency shift. So this example simply illustrates the importance of really having a good understanding of the underlying demography of your population, um, especially when you're trying to make inferences of natural selection. So the reason that our gene dropping simulations can account for gene flow is because we in explicitly incorporate the genotypes of the immigrants um, into our simulations. And so knowing now that we know that these simulations can appropriately um, account for both drift and gene flow, we wanted to see if there was any evidence for short-term um, selection causing allele frequency changes in our population over time. So to do this, we use gene dropping simulations to generate a uh, expected distribution of how much allele frequency change we might expect to see in our population. We then compare it to the actual observed allele frequency change, um, here shown in blue for this one particular SNP. And we can calculate an empirical p-value by accounting the number of simulations where the um, allele frequency change is more different from the median compared to the observed change. And so using this approach, um, we actually found some evidence of short-term selection on the bottom here, I'm showing you a Manhattan plot. These plots are gonna be showing up a lot. So I'm showing you um, the minus log 10 p-value on the y-axis for all of the SNPs in the, across our genome um, arrayed in kind of rough physical order on the X. Um, and the gray dots or the orange dots show the 18 SNPs that show evidence of um, short-term selection using an FDR of like 0.25. Um, we also wanted to take a step back and try to understand kind of genome-wide, what are the different processes that are governing kind of variants and allele frequencies that we see in the population over time. Since we have extensive population monitoring, we can construct this uh, model where the change in allele frequencies in our population from one year to another is um, simply the uh, change in like we can just estimate the allele frequencies in one year and subtract it from the allele frequencies in the other year. Um, we then categorized uh, the individuals in our population into three different categories. So we can try to partition the different processes that are um, causing, contributing to this change in allele frequencies we observe. So, uh, in any given year in our population, individuals in the population can be survivors. Um, these are individuals who were present in the population the year before and survived to um, this year. And um, the contributions of survivors uh, to the observed allele frequency change uh, from year to year is gonna be a function of the total proportion of the population that are survivors and the difference in allele frequencies between this kind of pool of survivors and the population, entire population the year before. Other individuals are gonna be new incoming immigrants um, and their contribution to allele frequency change is similar. Um, and finally, uh, the remaining individuals are nestlings, so new births. So using this equation and doing some um, kind of correction for the fact that we, what well, we can count all the individuals, we don't actually have genotype data for all of the individuals. So there's a little bit of error from sampling. Um, we can actually uh, categorize how much of the variance in allele frequency change is due to these different processes. So here I'm showing you kind of the contribution of survivors in red, um, of birth in orange, the covariance between survivors and births in yellow, and the contributions of new immigrants in blue. 
Um, this proportion varies a little bit from year to year, which is what we expect. And there are a few things to note here. One is um, kind of about 90% of the variance in allele frequencies we see in our population from year to year is due to variation in survival and reproduction. Um, we did some kind of pedigree simulations to try to assess. So survival and reproduction rate is going to be affected by both survival and drift. Um, we tried to do simulations to understand kind of how much heritable variation um, in fitness is compounding drift, the effects of drift from generation to generation. And we found kind of a minimal effect. And so we do think that um, most allele frequency change in our population is due to drift alone. Um, and I should also mention here that um, variation in offspring number is actually a part of, a natural part of genetic drift. Also, you'll notice here that the contribution of immigrants seems relatively low. And that is because in this particular model, we are only looking at the contributions of new immigrants. Whereas before where we were quantifying the total cumulative genetic contribution of immigrants, we were also including contributions of their offspring and grand offspring and whatnot. Um, it's also fun uh, to see that this model kind of reflects patterns that we observe in the field. So 2012 was an especially bad year in our population. We had the smallest birth cohort observed um, in kind of decades. And in this particular year, we see kind of an unusually high contribution of survival um, to kind of allele frequency change from year to year. So to quickly wrap up this first part of the talk, um, hopefully I've showed you that pedigrees are really powerful in understanding kind of short-term evolutionary processes. We can use pedigrees to estimate individual genetic contributions over time, um, which allow us to predict allele frequencies and um, also look at contributions of different types of individuals to uh, genetic variation in our population. We know that uh, incoming immigrants have a relatively high genetic contribution, expected genetic contribution to our population over time. And indeed, we have evidence that gene flow can drive some really large allele frequency shifts over short time periods. And there is some evidence of kind of rapid evolution of genotypes due to selection. Um, overall, our genome-wide variance in allele frequency change um, from year to year in our population is still primarily due to drift, which is like consistent with the small population size. So I've, everything I've told you so far has been focused on looking at changes in our population from year to year. But it's worth noting that um, there's a lot of kind of within generation variation that uh, could be important too. So in particular, natural selection is this very complex um, process and it can act at different stages of the life cycle. So here I'm showing you a life cycle diagram, a typical life cycle diagram for a sexually reproducing organism. Um, so uh, survival of individuals um, from zygotes to adults can be genetic. This is called viability selection. Um, there's also sexual selection. So not all individuals who survive to adulthood actually successfully reproduce. Um, those who reproduce may produce different um, numbers of offspring. So this is reflected in fecundity selection. And finally, there uh, is also an opportunity for gametic selection or kind of segregation distortion. Um, Tim Prout in 1965 was the first to point out that kind of our standard um, analyses of natural selection from generation to generation actually miss and um, miss uh, these different fitness components. And because, and so the most rigorous inference of selection actually should be looking at selection at these different life cycle stages. Um, and then Freddie Christensen over in Freidelberg in uh, the 70s developed this really elegant hierarchical series of tests to test for selection at these different life cycle stages separately. Um, and their analysis framework is called selection component analysis. 
So we went ahead and kind of tweaked their methods and applied it to our population. And in the last few minutes, I'll kind of run you through some of the results we've obtained so far. Uh, I'll start with gametic selection. So here, the null hypothesis that we're testing is whether or not heterozygote individuals transmit both alleles equally frequently to their offspring. So here's a kind of cartoon pedigree. If dad is a heterozygote, do we see an equal number of homozygote and heterozygote offspring? Um, to test for gametic selection, what we did was we kind of combed through our data set and counted up the, found all families where at least one parent was a heterozygote for a given SNP. And we counted up the number of um, offspring they produce of each different genotype. And using this information, we can use a likelihood approach to estimate the probability that the male transmits a given allele, the big A allele, um, and the probability that the female transmits the big A allele. Um, so, and then using this uh, framework, we can then use a likelihood ratio test um, to test for, test whether or not this probability is significantly different from 0.5, which is our goal. And so here I'm showing you uh, the Manhattan plot for our results. Um, we found two SNPs, like we found three SNPs that had really low p-values. One of them is, um, we found out was caused by like one or two males, and so we don't really trust the result. Um, but for the other two SNPs here, I'm showing you kind of the likelihood surface for um, what we think um, the probability of transmission for females is on the x-axis and the probability of transmission for males on the y-axis. And you can see that for some, like one of these SNPs, there's actually, we found really strong segregation distortion where the male transmits one allele kind of more than 80% of the time. Um, and so this is a little surprising. And um, we are, I should say right now that we are uh, in the process of following through on these hits. We still have to look at patterns of LD around um, any hit that we find from this and uh, the analyses I'll talk about shortly. Um, and we are still working on annotating our genome. So for the other three selection components, viability selection, sexual selection, and fecundity selection, uh, we decided to essentially do a genome-wide association study to look for these. Um, so I'll briefly introduce our framework. We use the mixed model approach where the response variable is either whether or not you, you're, whether or not you survived, whether or not you bred, um, or your clutch size. We included a series of different random effects. Um, all of our models included the kinship matrix um, to control for relatedness among the individuals in our sample. We also included natal year and natal nest as random effects. Um, I mentioned near the beginning of the talk that we had measures of a lot of different ecological variables. And so we had a whole suite of different possible fixed effects that we needed to consider. So this included attributes of the individuals, so things like age, hatching date, hatch order, um, whether or not they were an immigrant, et cetera. We also considered attributes of the natal nest that may affect um, fitness. So for instance, the number of helpers at the nest, the size of the territory, when it was last burned, um, how experienced or how old its parents were. And then finally, we looked at kind of environmental variables that vary from year to year. So population density, rainfall, temperature, et cetera. So we did a variable selection approach. Um, and once we identified the fixed effects that we needed to account for in any given model, we then fit, tested for a significant association with individual genotype for each of our SNPs. Um, so we did, a number of analyses, uh, we tested, uh, we ran models for females and males separately or for them combined, but here I'll just kind of show you some of the results from our sex specific analyses. So for viability selection, um, we were looking at survival to different life stages in the scrub jays. We banned all of our nestlings when they're 11 days old, and that's when we take a blood sample from them. Um, Florida scrub jays fledge the nest around day 18. They leave the nest around day 18. By day 30, they're a little bit more mobile. They stop pretending to be like pine cones hiding in the bushes. 
by 90, they're nutritionally independent from their parents. Um, by around day 300, they're physiological capable of breeding. And then we also check whether or not they establish as breeders. So for females, um, the analysis that yielded the most interesting results is looking at survival from day 30 to day 300. Some of the kind of factors that we found to be important here included rainfall, um, inbreeding coefficient and named all territory size. And um, oddly, we did find one SNP on chromosome 21 that seems to have a fairly large effect on survival. Um, so in the bottom right, I'm showing you kind of the predicted survival for females of different genotypes for at this particular SNP. And you can see that like the two homozygotes differ in survival by more than 25%. So it's a odd result um, considering that you one would expect something like survival to be highly polygenic and controlled by many of those small effects. So it's odd that we were picking up on this one large effect locally. Um, for sexual selection, this we had some interesting results in males. So here we were modeling um, age at first dispersal. So how old was a given male when they established as a breeder? Um, we controlled for how many breeding vacancies there were in the population in any given year and found three regions of the genome that were significantly associated with um, age at first dispersal in males. For fecundity selection, here we're modeling kind of clutch size. Um, and we did this analysis in females and males separately. Again, for both of them, it seems like kind of experience is really important. So whether or not um, the feet in particular, whether or not the female is a new breeder has a strong uh, impact on how many eggs she lays in her first clutch in a given season. Um, if we do the GWAS, we find hits uh, for both males and females, but interestingly enough, these hits are in different regions of the genome for females and males. Um, so this is, has been kind of a huge project um, where we've been just trying to really carefully dissect um, the impact of selection at these different stages of the life cycle and try to understand kind of how, what regions of the genome are associated with selection at these different life stages. We have you know, quite a bit of evidence that selection is important at these different stages of the life cycle. We find a number of SNPs associ strongly associated with these different selection components. Um, what we're doing now is trying to, is looking for, looking at correlations and effect sizes um, among these different selection components over time to see if we can uh, kind of quantify how much how important um, trade-offs are, for instance, or sexual antagonism. Uh, we have some, we were hoping, the hope was um, that uh, in theory, once you've done this kind of careful dissection of selection, the full selection component analysis, you should be able to use those results to predict allele frequency change in the population from year to year. Um, we don't see, we have looked to see whether or not our hits um, are associated with kind of the large allele frequency shifts that we found using our gene dropping analysis. And we don't really find evidence that our hits are increasing or decreasing um, hugely in allele frequencies over time. We have some preliminary evidence that we're still trying to work out the kinks that um, there seems to be an overall correlation between kind of effect size, so essentially like a selection coefficient and degree of allele frequency change in the population over time. But there's some kind of weird structure in the data um, that we're still trying to work out. But if anyone thinks about this problem, I would love to chat. Anyhow, um, so to wrap up, hopefully I've showed you that pedigrees and these long-term data sets are really kind of powerful systems for understanding how natural populations evolve over short time scales. Um, in particular, knowledge of the population pedigree allows you to estimate individual genetic contributions, um, which kind of will allow us to gain a lot of insight about how variation in individual fitness um, over time is actually kind of linked to allele frequency change. 
if you have a uh, knowledge of a population pedigree, then using gene dropping kind of simulation approaches is a really powerful way of modeling neutral processes in a population and actually the most appropriate way of modeling um, neutral processes in populations. In our study population in particular, uh, I showed you that gene flow is a really important contributor to genetic variation. We see like a lot of the uh, genetic variation in our population ex is expected to be brought in via immigration. And we actually find that gene flow can drive large allele frequency shifts in our population over time. But overall, um, most allele frequency change from year to year genome wide is due to drift. And finally, selection component analysis is this really nice approach for um, kind of understanding how important genetics is and um, governing selection at different like history stages and may kind of refine our understanding of the, of the role of selection in kind of causing allele frequency change over time. So everything I've talked about so far has been kind of uh, focused on single SNP analyses, but of course we know that kind of alleles in the genome are linked to each other. And so the next step for a lot of these is tracking kind of haplotypes in the pedigree as it's inherited um, from generation to generation to try to understand kind of realized genetic contributions and um, kind of refine our understanding of the genetic basis of fitness and um, the different evolutionary processes governing allele frequency change. So with that, like everyone else who's um, spoken in the series, none of this work would have been possible without the many, many um, students, PIs, and interns who've actually collected the data. The Florida Scrub Day study was started by Glenn Wolfenden, um, and John Fitzpatrick, Reed Bowman, Suche, and Angela Tringali have uh, kind of led the field work over time. Um, and we have a wonderful network of collaborators. I'd also like to think, uh, point out the folks who really helped with this work. So Rose Driscoll did the gene dropping on the Z work. Um, the other gene dropping project was done in collaboration with Yvonne Yurek and Graham Coop. And the selection component analysis, like all, pretty much all the analyses were done by Alyssa Cosgrove. And this project is done in close collaboration with Andy Clark. I'd like to thank my funding sources and my lab and my collaborators. And thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Great, terrific. I thought that was really terrific. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Let's see. So we have a couple of questions from Mark Halber, and I have a couple of questions. So maybe we'll start with those while people get the rest of their questions in. Um, Mark asks, are the same SNPs associated with male dispersal behavior? Could those, could those also be responsible for contributing to cooperative uh, breeding or helping behavior? Um, that's a good question. And we, I have no idea. We have not. <laughs> haven't that's like I haven't even touched um kind of trying to understand the role of genetics and cooperative breeding behavior I think that's an important question and something I was really interested in but I think very hard to answer still so I might just expand on that question a little bit to ask uh kind of what the prospects are for understanding the function in the of these SNPs, uh, how far away that, that goal might be, and whether you have any hypotheses about what these things might actually be doing. Yeah, um, I am not super, like there's a reason I kind of shy away from talking, saying, giving just those stories. Um, so there are a lot of different steps that need to happen first before we can even start to talk about um, functions of these genomic regions of interest. Um, we're still working on annotating the genome and assessing patterns of LD. Uh, I think once we do haplotype based analyses that will also help kind of refine the region of interest. Um, but one thing that uh, I know is a huge limitation of the study is we will never be able to do follow-ups um, so we can kind of annotate the regions and kind of refine the actual genomic region that we're interested in, but I think it would be very difficult to do the functional work that we would want to do in order to really follow up on any 
Yes. Um, I had another question, which is, uh, you know, in your diagram of different stages of the life history, um, it seems like part of sexual selection could be, uh, you know, dispersal to new new ranges. And so my question is, um, in your in your null models, you're accounting for gene flow, um, but it seems like potentially individuals that uh, manage to disperse effectively and 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 mate might be different in some way, right? That selection might actually be acting on the dispersal process, especially as, as habitat becomes more fragmented. And so I guess I'd, be, I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on the potential that selection might actually be intertwined with gene flow in some way, and if there's any way to account for that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Cause we know that kind of there's different fitness outcomes depending on how far you disperse from your natal nest. Um, there is a limit, somewhat of a limitation in our kind of um, assessment of the immigration rate and that only individuals who show up in the population long enough for us to kind of catch them and banded get incorporated in our data set. So it's totally possible that we have transient individuals just moving through. Um, this is one thing kind of trying to understand more about who these immigrants are and where they're coming from is something of great interest to my lab and I think others in the scrub group. Um, unfortunately, we don't have, I think to try to understand like, are the attributes, like you're right in that the immigrants who kind of show up in the population is successfully established may be kind of a particular subset of all individuals who are trying these long-term dispersal um, events. And I think without having more information about the source population, um, it's impossible to answer that question. So that is something of interest. Um, we are thinking about kind of expanding sampling to peripheral areas so we can get a sense of at least like where these immigrants are coming from, how many populations are they coming from, how do, how do levels of genetic variation and in inbreeding, et cetera, look in these other populations. Um, we have another question that's a little bit about function from Charlie Davies, who asks, uh, do you have any idea what genes the SNPs in your selection analysis are located in, if not, you know, the function of the specific SNP itself? I don't yet, sorry. Um, once we annotate things, I will let you know. <laughs> right. Well, we'll have to have you back. Um, uh, and Mark Halber also asked about kind of the logistics of operating during COVID-19. It looks like Angela uh, Tringali gave some a partial answer, but are you still able to collect blood samples and data during during COVID-19? What does field work look like this year? Um, we are incredibly fortunate in that um, the interns and kind of long-term staff, so Angela Tringali and Reed Bowman kind of run the demographic study right now. And they both live near the field site. We have interns and grad students who live on site. Um, and so we've actually been able to keep up with kind of the very basic demographic modeling. Um, there are certain kind of restrictions uh, because of COVID-19, but overall I think we're incredibly lucky. And I wanna thank all of those students and interns who are down there collecting data right now. Well, that's great to hear. Um, those are all the questions we have, I think that you may have just like shocked part of the audience into a state of awe and wonder at this extraordinary data set and these analyses. Um, so, oh, I take it back. We have one more late breaking question from Shaylee Shaw, who asked, uh, following up on the question of immigrant fitness, do you know if the genealogical contributions of immigrants are higher than those of individuals that remain within the population? Um, that's a good question, and we haven't actually, I haven't tested that using kind of longer term genealogical contributions. Um, that's something that one of my grad students is probably going to pursue. Um, we have some evidence that kind of total lifetime reproductive success of immigrants is slightly higher than those of residents. Um, and this is, we don't exactly know why, so we are um, interested in kind of looking at kind of immigrant versus resident fitness 
um, across different generations to see if we can try to disentangle is this due to um, simply um, like hybrid vigor. So we know immigrants are diff genetically distinct from our residents and therefore their offspring are less inbred and therefore will have higher fitness because of inbreeding depression. Um, or is it that immigrants are actually bringing in beneficial alleles? So we don't know that yet. And that's something we are um, hoping to work on. Okay. I think that closes out our question. So uh, thanks very much for that really terrific talk. Uh, and I have the title for next week's talk for everybody. So the um, next week we're gonna hear from Dr. Janet Mann, whose title is Diving Beneath the Surface, Three Decades of Research on Wild Bottlenose Dolphins. So I hope that you'll all join us next week. And uh, once again, thanks very much, Nancy. Thank you.